day was a mystery. And I spent a lot of time trying to unravel the mystery. I never thought of likening day to a sponge. Nor did I think of likening him to a clam or an oyster. Until I read a piece by Italo Calvino, in which the author interviews a clam. And it struck me that this interview is essentially Dave. It starts out with Calvino saying, so what was your life like? Mine? When I was clinging to that rock, you mean? 500 million years ago? With the waves rising and falling and me there, still flat, sucking what there was to suck and thinking about it all the time? If that's the time you want to know about, there isn't much to tell you. The system worked like this. A wave would come, and I, still sticking to the rock, would raise myself up a little bit, imperceptibly. All I had to do was loosen a little pressure slightly, and splat! The water passed beneath me, full of substances and sensations and stimuli. You never knew how those stimuli were going to turn out. Sometimes a tickling made you die laughing. Other times a shudder, a burning, an itch. So it was a constant seesaw of amusement and emotion. But you mustn't think that I just lay there passively, dumbly accepting everything that came. After a while, I had acquired some experience, and I was quick to analyze what sort of stuff was arriving, and to decide how I should behave, to make the best use of it, or to avoid the more unpleasant consequences. I wanted to make my mark, to mark my presence in an unmistakable fashion, something that would defend this individual presence of mine from the indiscriminate instability of all the rest. So I began to make a shell. The story culminates with one sentence. And it's a sentence that really puts me in mind of David. So now, after 500 million years have gone by, I look around and above the rock, I see a railway embankment and the train passing along it with a party of Dutch girls looking out of the window, and in the last compartment, a solitary traveler reading, reading Herodotus in a bilingual edition. And the train vanishes into a tunnel under the highway where there's a sign with pyramids and the words, visit Egypt, and a little ice cream truck tries to pass, a big truck laden with installments of Restigil, a periodical encyclopedia that comes out in paperback, but then it puts its brakes on because its visibility is blocked by a cloud of bees which crosses the road, coming from a row of hives in a field from which surely a queen bee is flying away drawing behind her a swarm in the direction opposite to the smoke of the train, which has reappeared at the other end of the tunnel. So you can hardly see anything thanks to the cloudy stream of bees and cold smoke, except a few yards farther up there's a peasant 
breaking the ground with his mattock. And unaware, he brings to light and reburies a fragment of a Neolithic mattock, similar to his own, in a garden that surrounds an astronomical observatory with its telescopes aimed at the sky and on whose threshold the keeper's daughter sits reading the horoscopes in a weekly whose cover displays the face of the star of Cleopatra. And I see all this. I feel no amazement because making the shell implied also making the honey and the wax comb, the coal and the telescopes, the reign of Cleopatra, the films about Cleopatra and the pyramids, and the design of the zodiac of the Chaldean astrologers, and the wars and empires Herodotus speaks of, and the words written by Herodotus, and works written in all languages, including those of Spinoza in Dutch, and the 14-line summary of Spinoza's life and works in the installment of the encyclopedia in the truck passed by the ice cream wagon. So I feel as if, in making the shell, I had made all the rest. <laughs>